we knew about those. We'd built them before, uh, right. but we'd never built anything like this. <laughs> uh, and the question immediately comes up, okay, and I, I was on the spot for this. Okay, what's that antenna? What's that radar for? Well, okay, we know it can pick up missiles and aircraft 1,000, 2,000 miles out. And both of the two radars, they built two of them. Mm -hmm. One, they located in a very unfortunate place uh, near uh, a nuclear power plant uh, called Chernobyl. Um, <laughs> Quite the place to put a uh, it, it, antenna. It, 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 well, they needed lots of power. Right. So, that so, makes sense. Uh, so they located near that. That turned out to be a bad choice later. They Robert Clark is an author on multiple books on intelligence collection and analysis. He has worked at the highest levels of government on high-impact intelligence operations. I spoke with Dr. Clark about the history and evolution of geospatial intelligence, the current conflict in Ukraine, and the future of the intelligence community. Enjoy Dr. Robert Clark. And the pace, I like it when people around here complain about traffic. I think it's hilarious because <laughs> I was on Market Street for five minutes. It's like, okay, traffic is when you consider ditching your car yeah. and moving on with your life. <laughs> That's traffic. Well, yeah, that was one of the, my memories of arriving here and starting to settle in was when we got the afternoon traffic report. Now, this was 20 years plus ago. Right. And uh, the traffic report, afternoon traffic report, there's been a fender bender in the Sears parking lot. That's it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's I'm home. Report. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a Wilmington, North Carolina traffic report. Mm -hmm. um, so I was hoping we could start out um, with just kind of learn a little bit about your background. Um, we'll post the bio and everything on YouTube in the description so, so people can please reference that um, and also subscribe while you're there. But I was hoping you could start out with your background in the military uh, and all that. Yeah, let me start uh, uh, at the point where I graduated uh, from college with a degree in electrical engineering. It's, it's a good place to start because at that point, I discovered I had a real talent for making perfectly good electronic equipment fail. <laughs> and uh, I was going into That's the Air talent. Force, and the Air Force said, well, with that talent, we have just the job for you. It's called Electronics Warfare Officer. And it was. It was a great job because uh, here I was with my special talent flying around in a B-52, jamming radar, jamming communications uh, for training and so forth. Great. Yeah. Great job. Then uh, they said, well, uh, okay, Clark, you got that job uh, down. Now, we need, our wing needs a combat intelligence officer. So you're going into intelligence. And I didn't know what intelligence was. <laughs> right. So, okay, I can do that. Uh, or at least I can try it. Didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, so there, this was my first experience with geospatial intelligence because right. I was uh, <clears throat> in charge of briefing air crews on what routes we should take if we had to go to war and penetrate Russian air defenses. Mm -hmm. And had to responsible for a lot of <clears throat> excuse me uh, maps and charts right. that were classified top secret. And they right. had our targets on them, and they had the locations of radars, search of air missile sites, government control centers, yeah. nuclear storage sites, all sorts of stuff. And they were updated about every couple of months or so. And I kept on saying, "How do they know all that stuff?" Right. How do they know exactly where uh, a, a nuclear-armed surface-to-air missile site is? Because uh, we weren't flying, or weren't supposed to be flying U-2s over Russia and China at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, what I didn't know, because it wasn't cleared, is that they had uh, satellites that were flying that were picking up radars and radio communications and locating sure. them. And we had just started flying imaging satellites, Corona. And so I learned about that. So what about, what, what year was this around? Oh, this was in uh, the uh, uh, late 60s. Okay. Because uh, uh, it was in the late 60s, I said, okay, uh, I'd like to go back to school. And I left mm -hmm. and went 
back to school a couple of degrees later. Uh, had to find a job, and CIA just happened to be interested in my mm -hmm. background. When you so, say a couple of degrees, <clears throat> to clarify, that's oh, a bachelor's in MIT, from MIT. Yeah. Uh, and then a PhD. PhD at Illinois. And then you got your Juris Doctorate later on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you've a done, couple degrees, so at least three. You've done your intelligence <laughs> very well. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I um, had uh, those degrees. But anyway, uh, the, the Juris Doctor hadn't happened yet. Uh, gotcha. Okay. But uh, CIA hired me because uh, the background. An intelligence background always helps if you're going to work there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my first job is one that's worth talking about because it really was an introduction to geospatial intelligence on a big scale. Uh, about the time I went to work as a newbie analyst, uh, the Russians, the Soviets, started building uh, what wound up being two massive radars. Now, when I talk massive, the antenna uh, of one, the transmitting antenna, uh, was a little taller than the uh, uh, Washington Monument. Wow. And the uh, length of the antenna stretched uh, almost the entire length of the uh, National Mall. Now, that's a big antenna. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that was the transmitting antenna. The receiving antenna was bigger. Wow. <laughs> now, massive am amounts of steel, two antennas uh, and enough power going into them to uh, power a small city. Uh, and uh, I'm working with the, uh, what was then called the photographic interpreters, then later imagery analysts and now geospatial mm -hmm. analysts yeah. uh, at the national level saying, okay, uh, what is that down there? What's that circular uh, donut shaped building doing? And uh, what is that particular little antenna doing? A whole bunch of things like that just putting together the pieces and looking at what direction are the radars facing. Okay, now what's out there that they could be looking at? Now these, there's only one type of radar that's that needs that big an antenna. Mm -hmm. It operates in high frequency band, shortwave band if you want to, or international broadcast. And uh, it uh, operates by, not like your normal radar, line of sight, if you can see it, the radar can see it, uh, but it jumps off the ionosphere back to Earth uh, and looks at targets 1,000, 2,000 miles out. Uh, and if the target's moving, it can pick it up, uh, the reflected return signal from it, mm -hmm. uh, aircraft, missiles, ships. Uh, and we'd, we knew about those. We'd built them before, uh, right. but we'd never built anything like this. <laughs> uh, and the question immediately comes up, okay, and I, I was on the spot for this. Okay, what's that antenna? What's that radar for? Well, okay, we know it can pick up missiles and aircraft 1,000, 2,000 miles out. And both of the two radars, they built two of them. Mm -hmm. One they located in a very unfortunate place uh, near uh, a nuclear power plant uh, called Chernobyl. <laughs> Um, it's quite the place to put a uh, it, antenna. It, 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 well, they needed lots of power. Right. So, so, Makes sense. Uh, so they located near that. That turned out to be a bad choice later. They, they put the other one in the Soviet Far East near Khabarovsk. Both of them were aimed at the same general location, the central United States, where our Minuteman missiles uh, silos were. So natural conclusion is, well, they're... Uh, going to detect, they're going to provide early warning of a missile launch against mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Right. Okay. And that's what my customers uh, thought would be the case. And I looked at it and said, okay, those radars operate one hop up to the ionosphere and back to Earth and then back. Uh, to look at the U.S. missile fields uh, 5,000 miles away, mm -hmm. you got to do one hop, two hops, probably three hops. I said, we've not done that. Uh, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, but they are in well positioned to see aircraft, our B-52s coming in from the uh, right. U.S. Uh, so they could be for that. And we went back and forth on this. And uh, they said, no, it's got to be uh, early warning ballistic missile. And I ran the numbers. Uh, <laughs> and the, 
way the radars were located, they go through the auroral zone. Gorgeous spatial intelligence. That's a nasty place to try to go uh, send a signal through. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I ran the numbers and said, they won't work. There's no way they can put enough power into those things to uh, detect a missile launch, except maybe two hours a day, each of those two radars, uh, different two hours, could possibly uh, detect a missile launch. I said, do you really build an early warning system that's only going to function four hours a day? I don't think so. And they end shot of it, all this after a long mm -hmm. time. They were right. They were for ballistic missile early warning. I was right. They didn't work. <laughs> uh, and no. years later, we found out why. Russian leaders were so desperate for early warning that a bunch of scientists in the Soviet Union got together and said, hey, let's sell them on this idea. And they knew it wouldn't work when they built it. Uh, the scientists did, but they, they got jobs out of it. Right. Uh, so those two radars now are rusting pieces of steel, uh, long since abandoned. But uh, it, it, there's a lesson here. Mm -hmm. uh, the other guy isn't always going to make logical or even reasonable decisions. Right. Sometimes they're really going to do stupid things. And you have to, if you're in intelligence, you have to accept the possibility that the other leaders are going to make bad decisions. They do it again and again. So that was my introduction to analysis and <laughs> basic lesson. So, so it sounds like a, a saying I've heard somewhere. I can't um, pin its origin, mm -hmm. but you know, never assume malice when you can assume stupidity. Uh, that's a good aside. I hadn't heard that one, but <laughs> yes, uh, uh, because, uh, and we've seen that in this last year. Uh, sometimes people right. can make exceptionally stupid decisions. Yeah. So, so you were at, you were at CIA at this point? Yeah, um, for, for around uh, 12 years. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what was your, what was the path like from CIA um, to go work over at DNI and then eventually start your own company, right? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I jumped from CIA to starting my own company, which uh, I did pretty well. Got to about about the size of your company, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, around seventy people, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, then I decided I wanted to just write <laughs> books and uh, yeah. let somebody else uh, uh, handle uh, contracting for the government. Uh, yeah, well, I I definitely get that because it's it's a grind. As a contractor, it's frustrating. Uh, you're dealing with massive bureaucracies. You're dealing with um, not just the government bureaucracies, but the industry bureaucracies as well. And um, but congrats for selling your business and, and moving on with your life and writing these awesome books. So I have a book here, actually. I uh, see that. Can show up on the, on the camera here. This is one of your books. You have how many? How many books do you have? Uh, um, around eight, uh, uh, not counting uh, the uh, subsequent editions mm -hmm. of the analysis book, which has been the most successful. Uh, yeah. So this one is geospatial intelligence origins and evolution. And anybody that's looking to learn anything about geospatial intelligence, this is a fantastic book. It's on Amazon. Um, you can you might find it on eBay uh, as well. Um, are are they using this uh, at schools anywhere? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I as a matter of fact, let's see. Uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uses it in a course uh, on geo, geospatial intelligence. Right. Uh, I know it's it's selling some other schools, but I haven't. I really. gotcha. Um, so I was hoping you could sign it for me today, if with you don't a, mind. With pleasure. Uh, <laughs> That'd be awesome. So, so we'll do it right now. Yeah, but, let's do it right now while we're here. Okay. Now let me. I've got to give you an inscription here. Okay. All right. Well, while you're while you're thinking of that, I can um, talk about some other things. Uh, so this this book, the geospatial intelligence book. If you're unfamiliar with geospatial intelligence at all, um, it's gone through this massive transition over the past 20 years where when I was in the military, I was a satellite imagery analyst, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, someone said, ah, well, what they're really doing is pinpointing and working with location more than, than using just the imagery. Imagery is one source. It's one mm -hmm. Um, vector of understanding what's happening on the ground. But then you have things like, and your book is fantastic. It breaks down everything about geospatial intelligence. You have your cyber approach, your you know geolocation from signals intelligence, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I definitely recommend checking out the book, even if you're just tangentially interested in the topic. Um, but I was hoping maybe you could talk about that a little bit, what that transition has been like. And ge for geospatial intelligence, mm -hmm. like I said, when I was in the military, I was a 96 Delta in the Army, which was okay. a satellite imagery analyst. Okay. And then by the time I got out of active duty in 2006, after a nice fun run in Iraq, they had changed it to geospatial analyst. Mm -hmm. yep. My thought was, look, I'm doing the same job. I'm looking at satellite imagery. You're just calling it something else. What is this? I don't know how to describe this, but what is what has been the that push to go from, you know, this what used to be called imagery intelligence, Emmet, that was the thing, and now it's GeoInt, and it, and and I even see GeoInt moving in and morphing into something else. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was hoping you could enlighten me on, on how that transition occurred into being, you know, well, well let me. Uh go back to a few of the origins uh, that led to both this book and I mm -hmm. think kind of point to where GEO is going, I think. Um, because, um, well, for background, uh, something that I know that you know, every major discipline or field that uh, where the military has to turn to industry for right. goods, services, equipment, take your pick. Mm -hmm. They develop a professional association. So mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force Missileers have their U.S. Space, Space Force Association. Right. Navy Aviators have their Tail Hook Association <laughs> that occasionally gets infamous. Uh, and uh, my own profession, electronic warfare, uh, has its uh, professional association called the Association of Old Crows. A nice, cute name. Uh, anyway. And the whole idea is you have every year an annual meeting where industry and the military and the government get right. together, display their wares, and uh, basically sales event. And, sure. Uh, and you have your professional journal that comes out every month or so. Uh, and uh, they just continue to do that. Uh, and as you know, because both of us are members, uh, uh, the U.S. Geospatial Intelligence Foundation was right. developed back around 2002 by a industry uh, a friend of mine in the industry, Stu Shea. Uh, he started it. He was the first president. And uh, in around 2002, uh, about the same time, he and General Clapper, who was in head at that time of new head of uh, NEMA, uh, NEMA, the National Imagery and Mapping Association, which is now the National in, Geospatial, Geospatial Intelligence Cla Agency. Thanks to General Clapper, who okay. changed the name. The two of them uh, came up with the idea of geospatial intelligence about the same time and came up with the name GeoInt. And at the time, I thought that was fabulous. Uh, I, it's, it's a great concept. Uh, but I said, you're treating it like... It is just another collection in one of the big five, uh, mm -hmm. human intelligence, human uh, uh, signals, intelligence, SIGINT, geospatial intelligence, geoint. Okay, yeah, you do collection, but it's not the same as the rest. It's not a collection right. in. It is an all-source analysis mm -hmm. uh, discipline, and it, you should distinguish it. Uh, but for political reasons, they really couldn't do that mm -hmm. uh, because you have all sorts of analysts in CIA and DIA who say, right. stay in your own lane. <laughs> Get out of our lane. Um, right. Well, you can't. Uh, and <clears throat> the leaders of NGA have told me that more than mm -hmm. once. <clears throat> I, I'm not arguing with you, but we just can't do that. <clears throat> yeah, so um, <clears throat> the... The thing about geospatial intelligence is mm -hmm. everything happens somewhere. So even that signals intelligence technically could be considered geospatial intelligence if you have the latitude and longitude, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. It, it is. And uh, that's another point where I said you're, you're not quite doing this right because you're saying you have to have imagery because they did either imply right. or right. say, we got to have imagery to do geo. And no, you don't. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. Every day, satellites around the world and aircraft mm -hmm. uh, geolocate and track aircraft, mm -hmm. missiles, um, ships, ships, yeah. uh, 
uh, vehicles due to their radar emissions or their radio emissions. And every day around the world, you have sites that detect se seismic emissions and pinpoint where there are earthquakes or mm -hmm. e underground explosions because they're watching out for underground nuclear tests. That's, that's uh, geoint as you've defined it, except you don't use imagery. Right. And every day uh, you have, and the U.S. Navy has all of these underwater sound systems uh, that detect, locate, and track sub submarines underwater. No, Im no imagery. So you, you don't need imagery to do geoint. Right. You, you can use lots of sources, and you do. And uh, uh, that was what provoked this book. Uh, because ah, okay. I said, you got to tell that story. Um, and I decided to write it. And at the time, I was working for USGIF uh, with two friends, uh, uh, Todd Bacastal, Professor of uh, Geospatial mm -hmm. and, uh, Affairs at uh, Penn State, and uh, Tim Walton, who is a, is a professor at uh, uh, George uh, Sorry, James Madison University, okay, up in Virginia, and uh, the three the th they taught me a lot of different perspectives about uh, you and they said, you know, one of the things you got to think about is this: there are two basic types of intelligence, which we all know about. You can be descriptive, describing what's happened mm -hmm. or what's going to. I mean, sorry, or what's happened or what uh, is happening. You can be predictive describing what's going to happen. Uh, now, analysts don't like that word at all. Right. Uh, so they say, we don't do predictions. We don't tell fortunes. Uh, right. And, and they like to use the word anticipatory. Now, if you can tell the difference between anticipatory and predictive, <laughs> but uh, great. Uh, right. And um, I, I was fine with those two. I understood those. But then they said, there's a third one. And... This is very important distinction. They said, there's a kind we call prescriptive. Now, analysts really hate that because that's saying, okay, this is the intelligence, Mr. Military Commander or Mr. Decision Maker. This is what you should do about it. We just don't do that at the national level, right. or at least we haven't done that because uh, we, we think of it as the third rail of intelligence. Uh, you touch it and you're electrocuted uh, or you, your career is shattered. Uh, and uh, they said and no. Why? Why? Why is that? Like, why uh, would that? Oh well, two things. One, if if you say to your uh, commander or your uh, policymaker, you really ought to do this about it, mm -hmm. uh, this intelligence. Uh, then, when they act, you're responsible, at least partly, if not totally, for right. what happens. Right. Now, now, in intelligence, you you'll often get blamed for what happens anyway, <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, the uh, uh, they analysts uh, in the intelligence business, the national level anyway, really don't want to do that. They kind of do it indirectly, but mm -hmm. they uh, officially they don't do it. Well, that's changing. It, it's changed quite a bit over my career right. because for several reasons. One being uh, that uh, we analysts now have the tools to do predictive or anticipatory intelligence mm -hmm. to see what's happening, to, to tell a commander, if you do this sort of thing, this is likely to happen. If you do that, that sort of thing right. will happen. Right. Um, and uh, so it, it can be done. It's been being done in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and I see it as the future of geospatial intelligence, certainly, is not only being able to tell uh, your customer, this is what is likely to happen, and but this is also some of the things you can do about it, and this is what will happen if you do those things. Right. It's 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 definitely a trend. Yeah. You, no, you, your company builds some of those tools. <laughs> we sure do. Um, that's that's interesting because um, when I worked at CIA, uh, they'd always say, you know, you're not the decision maker, you're the analyst, right? Yep. They would say that, but then they would always come to me and say, hey, what? You know, what should we, where should we be looking at over here? Where, where, where should we be going next? 
Yeah. And I say, well, I'm just the analyst, but I'll tell you right now, if you go here, you're going to find what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yep. So I always find that kind of interesting distinction. Yeah. They, yeah. If they ask, then analysts will say, well, if they did to you, analysts will sometimes say, okay, you ask for my opinion. This, this, is, right. this is where I would go with it. Uh, and this is what will happen if you do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess you're right. That does have a double-edged sword because certainly um, – if you're, you know, the lead decision maker on something, you should have more information at your disposal. Whereas uh, a lot of times in geospatial intelligence, we're just looking at the geospatial intelligence. We're not necessarily reading the human reports and the no. all source reports and all those things. So I'd hope that, you know, a senior uh, decision maker would have access to those things and, um, and wouldn't be making you know, harsh decisions based on just you. And although GeoInt's powerful, especially when you add things like video, yep. you know, when you see somebody doing something on a video, it's hard to dispute, right? It's hard to say anything otherwise. Um, well, you, you got used to that, uh, I suspect, during the Iraq war when uh, the uh, commanders had access to right. all that. Uh, uh, it was the first, the first time that we were able to fly un, unmanned aerial assets and kind of see what's happening on the ground. And, you know, uh, I remember seeing that in 2000, I was in Iraq in 2004, part of 2005. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw a full motion video from an ISR asset, I was like, what is this? Yeah. You know, we had been looking at satellite imagery, which is great, but it's slow. You know, I got to download these massive files, but then there it was just a video. Coming sure. down of what's happening, like this is brilliant. This is amazing. It also, and now today it's it, it also is addictive. Oh yes, <laughs> and, and that was the problem because commanders yeah. could just stare for hours yes. at the, that video. And, uh, they're supposed to be making decisions and deciding what to do. <laughs> right. You're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. So, but but, you, that's, that's, but that's why that's why you know I think um, full motion video analysts. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's one of those things that looks from the outside. It's like stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. From the outside, it looks super easy. Oh, that person's just watching a video and saying what happens. But I guarantee you, you put a good full motion video analyst against a layman and mm -hmm. watch the same video, that full motion video analyst is going to pick up details they didn't even think of. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a super critical skill, especially now in today's intelligence space where full motion videos, it's, it's ubiquitous. You got to have... You got to have ISR somewhere with that video mm -hmm. shooting down um, as to what's happening on the ground. So uh, anyways, yeah, I was hoping we could continue on with um, talking about, you know, that kind of evolution into, mm -hmm. into GeoInt. So um, you talked about the different types of intelligence that you can collect and, and, um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, where do you kind of see it evolving to now? If, if you're paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine or really any of these any of these hot spots around the world it seems to have morphed into an OSINT driven uh intelligence picture where you know social media and things like that I actually just saw the other day some russian troops were killed because they gave away their position on social media that was in the day's so, uh, news yeah yeah so num number one rule of being at war do not post on tiktok or wherever your location because you're gonna get a missile right right that's right <laughs> right in your forehead so um what do you think about all that well um it's uh, one of the really big changes that uh we've observed particularly in ukraine um mm -hmm. and so uh, let's focus for a little bit on Ukraine because okay. uh, it's it the way it started was uh, the way very often in the past as far as intelligence and the military and the national leadership working together, uh, but uh, un, kind of an unfortunate pattern that has developed over the years. Now uh, right. let, let, let's talk about that and then get up to the Ukraine uh, historically. When your national intelligence customer uh, is out there trying to make a decision and you give them something they don't want to hear, they mm -hmm. fall into a pattern. Uh, they'll come back maybe next day, maybe next week and say, are you sure? We want to recheck that. And, mm -hmm. and you come back and say, here's the answer. They're going to invade if that's the answer. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
then um, you uh, keep on doing that. And then the next thing they'll do is uh, typically they don't like the answer they're hearing from your uh, intelligence service. So they'll go to their allies right. and say, what are, you, what are you thinking? Now, that's always just absolutely blown my mind. Uh, you have paid billions of dollars to build the best intelligence mm -hmm. service in the world. And when it tells you something that you don't like to hear, you're going to some outfit that has a dinky <laughs> right, intelligence right, service right, right. and an agenda. The government has an agenda that's different from yours. And you're asking for their opinion and they're listening to them instead of us. And now you're familiar with the Iraq War, the Desert mm -hmm. Storm, the works. Sure. That's exactly what happened then. Uh, our national intelligence officer for warning said they're going to invade. U.S. didn't want to hear that. that. They, they did not want to hear. Right. And he said the invasion's going to happen, and it's going to happen in one day. Uh, and, and there will be no further warnings. And the, our government went to the uh, Saudis, the uh, not the Syrians, but the Egyptians, and some of the other mm -hmm. countries in the Middle East, and asked their leaders, uh, do you think the, that the Iraqis, Saddam Hussein's going to invade Kuwait? And they said, no. no, no. <laughs> right. And that's the answer that the government wanted to hear. So they were happy with it until the invasion mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Okay. Uh, something like that started to develop mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the lead up to Ukraine, because our intelligence service, as near as I can tell, knew sometime in early December that Russia was going to invade right. Ukraine. Yeah. And they provided that warning, and it started out with the same pattern. Uh, next week, they'd call and say, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, what happened, though, at, in the end was uh, smart, uh, must be smarter people working in the government than we had way back in uh, 1990 because uh, uh, they – Accepted, and well, I, I think it helped that the uh, British and the Germans and some of the others said, "Yeah, we think they're going to invade." Right. <laughs> so, so you didn't get any help there. But anyway, the government turned around and accepted the intelligence, and they did something that uh, is different than the way we've done in the past. They started planning. Okay, it's going to happen. Let's plan a, a using social media and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, press releases, uh, all sorts of sources. Let's uh, disrupt them as, as much as we can. Uh, so we learned the Russians were going to pull some disinformation campaign. We'd publicize it. That's right. something that really hadn't been done with intelligence in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, coming out and saying, okay, uh, they're, they're, the other side's going to do this and just absolutely must have driven Putin crazy. Right. Uh, see that happening again and again because it just blew the story up uh, beforehand. And then, of course, the invasion happened and GeoInt really came into its own. We were right. sharing it, re releasing and sanitizing intelligence and letting it go out to the public and to the Ukrainian uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a way we hadn't before. And what intelligence was doing and its customers uh, uh, everybody in the game, the analysts, the collectors, the, the customers, all working together at a level I hadn't seen in my right. career, except maybe very few times. Um, and uh, it's a different way of collecting intelligence, analyzing it, and using it, uh, in that you have everybody working together on it. Uh, and I wrote a whole book uh, back in the... Uh, around 2000, uh, on that very idea, uh, uh, how intelligence analysis ought to uh, go. Because as you and I, as uh, uh, intelligence uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we learn in school is, intelligence school is, there is an intelligence cycle, right? That's right. And uh, it starts with you tell the collectors what you want, and they collect it. And then you hand it over to uh, processors who process the image, uh, decrypt the encrypted communications, mm -hmm. take your pick. You hand it to uh, 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 processing uh, an, 
exploitation, exploitation. Uh, whether you annotate the diagram or you translate the language do, uh, and uh, make it understandable. You hand that uh, over to analysts who analyze it, give it context meaning, and it goes to the military commander, the decision maker in Congress or the White House, uh, and they ask more questions and the collection cycle starts again. Mm -hmm. That cycle, which we uh, built and uh, it attained almost theological significance, <laughs> uh, right. was built on the whole idea of the flow of paper which is the way things originally went. Right. You handed the paper over, it got turned into an intelligence report, into a finished intelligence report, and so forth. When, and we kept that, even when we got rid of the paper. And all of a sudden, we had all these tools and these ways of communicating that would let us come together, uh, focus on the target with everybody contributing their knowledge to build a model, a picture of what yeah. was happening and what was likely to happen. And that was what my book on analysis was all about because uh, it just made sense. I said, the intelligence cycle doesn't work in practice. It, it never really did. It right. was always somewhat interactive. And now we've got the tools to make it really interactive. And uh, you guys built one of those uh, really neat tools to help do that called Pattern Flows, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah, we have software that's, um, it does help. ISR, PED, things like that. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, it, you can use it as a tool to share with customers, right? That's right. It it's helps disseminate so that what you talked about, processing, exploitation, and dissemination, it helps with actually all three of those um, yeah, yeah. portions. But um, what I think is interesting about what you're saying is, um, you know, there's, there's at no point does any intelligence analyst say, oh, well, I'm in the exploitation part of the intelligence cycle, no. right? I'm in the processing part, right? They're just doing their job. They're working through their workflows. They're trying to be efficient, right? Add that good context if, if that's their role. Um, there's no, you know, no one really thinks about the cycle or what they're, what they're in. They're building something. We're, you're building a picture. We're yeah. building something to get to a decision maker so they can make the best decision, right? They can make the best decision based on you know, actionable, real facts, right? Like yes. that's that's the intelligence um, apparatus. That's yeah. what it's for. And and I also said uh, the decision maker is not the end of all this. Right. The, the decision maker mm -hmm. is needs to be a part of the process mm -hmm. all the way through. Uh, they they have critical roles to play, and if you j try and shut them out and just give them the finished intelligence, they're going sure. to go get their own intelligence anyway yeah. from yeah. other governments if they have to. Right. Uh, That's a good point. It, it's, uh, uh, you, you get them involved from the beginning. So you really understand what they're trying to do and what they need from you. And you get them to contribute their image of what the target is. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you can, there's a lot of back and forth uh, that all the players have to get used to doing. Fortunately, again, you get the if you build the tools to let them do it, uh, I think it happens. So it's it's less of a cycle and more of a, you know everyone building a sandcastle together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it yeah. is exactly that. And uh, the uh, intelligence agencies have started to mm -hmm. accept that idea. Uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, about six eight years ago created a new model. They discarded the cycle and mm -hmm. said, uh, and said basically around surrounding this uh, model, what they called uh, this object, this well, a target, uh, are all these people contributing uh, knowledge uh, right. and then extracting what they need to do their jobs from this picture, mm -hmm. this, this uh, model. They called it object-oriented uh, uh, right. intelligence, I think. Anyway, uh, but they, they all made the same mistake of kind of setting the customer off. You know, the customer shouldn't have access to all this secret, uh, specially compartmented information. They should uh, just get the end result. Well, no, bring the customer right. in. Right. Uh, make sure you understand what they need and then uh, uh, let them see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So at the end, they'll accept what you've done uh, rather than feel like uh, they're being handed something that 
could be good or could be really bad because they don't they don't know how it was developed. So that intelligence sandcastle that was being built for the invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, what did you know? What did you notice about that that was interesting or different? Well, uh, as I say, the uh, the idea that uh, we were we were actually doing uh, anticipatory or predictive intelligence, mm -hmm. that is, predicting what would happen, but also doing prescriptive intelligence, saying if we do these things, this is what's likely to happen. Uh, and the policymakers were a part of that. I, I, mm -hmm. what I saw. Uh, we again, we've occasionally done that in the past in a crisis, and uh, but I think it's becoming more accepted that this is the way we're going to do things. Uh, right, because it uh, it it works well. It's worked beautifully in Ukraine. Yeah, the <clears throat> Ukraine has really shown, I think, the evolution of where intelligence is going. It's mm -hmm. it's yeah. pushing much more into what I think is logical is more unclassified intelligence. You know, oh yeah, it's these these secure networks are incredibly difficult to push data mm -hmm. to and pull data from. Um, but you know what? A kid on the street with his cell phone, they can provide a lot of intelligence now. Uh, they can capture audio, video, um, mm -hmm. all sorts of details about things. And uh, I think the Ukraine war has really shown that in a way that we've, I think it's just been eye-opening. If you go onto almost any social media site, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and you just search Ukraine war, you will see ground level video mm -hmm of things that are occurring on the ground. Or you'll see a drone video of it dropping a, a yeah. bomb on a Russian guy in a trend, you know, trench somewhere. Um, so I think it's really been eye-opening. And I think about, as a geospatial intelligence person, mm -hmm. what am I gonna do with all this data, right? Like, it, it's, it's almost like these, it's almost like whack-a-mole. You know, it, you get this, this point of data right here that pops up, oh, there's a Russian thing here, or uh, there's something over here. It's, it's almost, so much data that you have to it's it's almost like corralling it into a into a an understandable picture mm -hmm. um yeah. which requires a lot of people a lot of people <laughs> to do that yeah and your whack-a-mole uh, uh, analogy is a good one because uh, that's what the policymakers, at least the ones i dealt with in washington mm -hmm. uh had to do every day they uh they came in and the day was just a crush, sometimes 12 hours or more, of uh, uh, whacking the mold as it popped up, uh, hitting <laughs> right. one crisis after another. Uh, the idea of planning for more than a day or two ahead, right. it just, they didn't have time to do that. Yeah, and, how, how can you do that when you have so much data and a 24-hour news cycle and, mm -hmm. and things like that? Well, you need lots of help in people who uh, are doing mm -hmm. intelligence and can help you figure out what's going to happen next uh, because um, if you let the crises come to you mm -hmm. and don't anticipate them, uh, that's what you're going to be doing. You're just going to be reacting continuously. There, there's been a lot happening recently. Um, well, I guess it, it's not that it happened recently. It's been reported recently um, through Twitter. I actually saw something last night um, where the intelligence agencies and the uh, intel uh, committee from from Congress has a lot more influence over the social media censorship than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you think the intelligence community's role is in interacting with these social media companies? Like, oh. I know it's a tough it's a tough question. Um, uh, there's smarter people than I who can right. probably answer that uh, question. Uh, social media, I mean, we we started uh, before there was social media. Mm -hmm. uh, even before then, most of the intelligence that we used uh, in our estimates, in our uh, reporting, uh, something like 90% uh, came from open sources. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, though... Certainly, the amount of video and uh, imagery generally and signals available, uh, 
a lot more of those have come on mm-hmm. online uh, in recent years. But we can't process, we can't handle all of it. We, we just have to be right. smart, figure out tools for finding the material that's really mm-hmm. important in that mass. Uh, that was what got us uh, started in uh, the IT business way back in the 70s is we're just dealing with this volume of incoming material mm-hmm. uh, that we just couldn't handle. And I, I still think we're choking on, yeah. uh, on information, raw information that has to be, has to be made sense of. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's a problem. It's always been a problem my entire career. It right. still is. I, I think recently, if you look at um, these large language models, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's that's the pathway is to integrate these data sources into these large language models. And um, as opposed to playing whack-a-mole, you can start to ask questions and search for things. It's When you say of, large language models, uh, what are we talking about? Yeah, so um, recently there's a company named OpenAI and and they released a large language model car called chat gpt mm-hmm. and basically uh, a very rudimentary explanation is that it's trained on information right it's trained on information from the internet from mm-hmm. academic mm-hmm. articles and things like that mm-hmm. and it's able to the way the language models work is it's using probability Mm -hmm. So it says this word is likely to come after this word based on all of these things that I've read, I've been trained on, right? The model. Mm -hmm. And it's actually able to provide some stunning results. So if you, if you ask chat GPT and there's other language models, it's not the only one, but these large scale language models, Mm -hmm. you can ask it almost any question. It's going to give you a cogent response. You know, Mm -hmm. what is geospatial intelligence? It will give you a very good response. Some of it's probably based on your book, actually. Um, if you if you ask it to check code for you, it'll do that. If mm-hmm. you ask it to, um, you know, write a blog post on you know the Ukraine and uh, Russia war, mm-hmm. it'll it'll do that pretty accurately. Um, so it's actually pretty pretty stunning. So to me, the the path is having an intelligence large language model that's capable of integrating data at you know, blinding speeds. Obviously, the data has to be accurate, or else the training, mm-hmm. uh, the training won't be good enough to provide good results. It'll provide inaccurate results, which is not good. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, but as far as I know, and I'm sure I'm positive, CIA, NSA, um, somebody out there is working on this intelligence language model that can, you know, integrate that data quickly and get your report. There are some tools actually. Um, one called GeoSpark. I believe they were purchased by Sirius re- recently. Um, but what they do is is very similar. They're using natural language processing, um, looking at news articles in mm-hmm. multiple languages from around the world and predicting threats. Uh, and that's all, uh, you know, AI ML based. So these tools are coming. They're coming. They're on the way. And as the gut, you know, of course, the government's going to take 10 years longer than the in- <laughs> than. Well, the not commercial necess- sector. Not uh, maybe so, uh-huh. maybe, and maybe not, uh, because uh, uh, the intelligence community was out in front a long time ago. They, now, uh, commercial uh, entities always can move faster than government, so right. um, this may have changed. But way back in the seventies, uh, uh, we at CIA we were uh, working on. Right. How can we use artificial intelligence? And uh, we, but because of this mass of incoming data, mm-hmm. we had to deal with it. it just was too much uh, for us humans mm-hmm. uh, to sort through and co- comprehend. And uh, and they made, I'd say, some strides, uh, but not uh, at the speed that it looks like we've done in recent years. Uh, and AI, uh, we were long, most of us analysts at least, mm-hmm. long were skeptical of AI. Uh, we could see that work was going on, but, uh, and we weren't the only ones. Uh, 
it back around 1981, 82, somewhere in there. Uh, the U.S. government was working on the Strategic Defense Initiative, mm -hmm. known as Star Wars. And the <laughs> director of that uh, program, Star Wars program. Uh, George Lucas. Uh, I'm, I'm joking. That's, that's the director <laughs> of Star Wars movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you caught me there. Uh, he said, okay. Uh, I didn't know George has got uh, that uh, degree in that background. <laughs> anyway, the director of the program was before an audience, and he took a question and said, uh, are you using artificial intelligence in the Star Wars program? He didn't answer the question directly, mm -hmm. which may or may not tell you anything. But he said, artificial intelligence has a lot of promise. It always has had, and it always will have. <laughs> now, that's not a compliment. Right. Uh, right. And uh, so... Uh, like him, I was a bit of a skeptic for a long mm -hmm. time uh, because I didn't see it being applied by the analyst the, mm -hmm. or the collector, the normal human being who has to use this stuff in right. everyday use. Uh, I think that's changing. I'm still a little bit on the skeptical side about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, well, let me, let me change your mind. After this, after this podcast, after we're done, I'm going to show you chat GPT, okay. which I, I think is going to change your mind. It's, it's the first large scale language model that the public kind of has access to. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think it's going I think it's going to change your mind about the skepticism towards AI. Well, I I'm uh, not skeptical that it will work. Uh, right. I'm still skeptical until I see it actually gotcha. being used okay. by an analyst to uh, accomplish something that's worthwhile. Uh, I think every intelligence analyst on the face of the earth needs to have this tool with them right now. Mm -hmm. It's as it's as every bit as useful as Google. I mean, it's it's fantastic. So yeah. I'll well, show it to you after this, and you'll you'll okay. agree or disagree. We can we can do that. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we we do need those tools because if we are going to do prescriptive intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, make that bold step forward. I think machine learning and right. uh, AI are going to really need to be part of that because. Uh, we, we, if for nothing else, as a cross check on our own intuition, mm -hmm. uh, then as we solve the struggle with the problems. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good okay. point because mm -hmm. every human has bias, right? <sighs> yes. We, we all have bias. I, I keep trying to say, eliminate your biases. I have my own, I can't <laughs> eliminate them all. Yeah, yeah, it's everyone has bias. I think it's important, especially in intelligence. Is that you understand what your biases are? It's it takes some yeah. it takes a level of humility. I've always said that humility is probably one of the most important traits of a good intelligence person is understanding. Hey, I could be wrong about this. I need to really drill down and make sure that I'm right here because the consequences can be deadly for someone. So absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was my first experience going back to the over the horizon radar story. I mean, right. I, yeah. I, my first uh, assignment out of the block, out of the gate, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and you, uh, you just need to realize there's something more at play than let's say what your rational thinking uh, yeah. would uh, let you go to. I gotcha. Um, are you working on any other books right now? No, 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 not at the moment. I, uh, I did uh, at one point uh, about two years ago. I said, okay, and, and this is going back to artificial intelligence and machine learning. I said, what would intelligence look like at the national level if, uh, in the future, we had all those tools hel helping right. us? Uh, uh, and uh, technology advancing the way I would expect it would. Um, and if we actually were working together closely, as I've described mm -hmm. in my book, about uh, analysts, collectors, uh, and customers all uh, sharing, uh, creating this picture of what was happening. And I, and I wrote a novel about it. Uh, oh, really? 15 years in the future, what intelligence would be like. Uh, and uh, it's not going to see the light of day. Oh, really? <laughs> Agent, agents, uh, because these days, uh, 
it, it, these days, if you don't have some sort of a Yellowstone-like plot where the people are getting killed and, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's action uh, and excitement all the time, uh, it just doesn't sell too well. Well, uh, intelligence is more like a detective story, right. a Sherlock Holmes story, uh, puzzling things out from evidence. And that just doesn't sell books. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a great point. You always see these movies uh, about the intelligence community, mm-hmm. right? And there's always some analyst who run, you know, is running for the train to catch the bad guy. It's like, no, that's not what an intel analyst is doing. Okay, no, no, uh, <laughs> no. There are very few people in intelligence, uh, yeah, d- do that sort of thing. Special ops types guys. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> you know, we send in the we send in the um, the heavy hitters. We're not out there. No, <laughs> no, I. Uh, I may be able to shoot a pistol, but I don't want to go around uh, okay. carrying one. So, you, so you're working on a novel, but you don't think it's you don't think you're going to publish it? Uh, Why not? I finished it, but my, my my wife, who is also my uh, editor of all oh, my books, okay. chief critic, and the chief reason the books succeed, uh, says uh, looked at it and says, uh, "You're not sending this any place." I've told you again and again, you can't write. <laughs> <laughs> She'd probably write. Well, I think you should publish it. Uh, yeah. I think you should publish it. If I find an agent and I get uh, my wife to agree, maybe I will. If you are an editor, an agent or something, you need to get in touch with me. I will hook you up with <laughs> with Robert Clark because I guarantee you whatever <laughs> is in that book is awesome. Uh, guaranteed. Uh, yeah, but their question is going to be legitimately. Will it sell? <laughs> will it well, sell? it might sell to you and I and uh, people in the community who understand this is the real world of intelligence. Right. But, but the... The indus- the media has created this picture of intelligence and I don't know right. how, I don't, uh, that's unreal, but I don't know if we can get away from it. Yeah, it's it's it is crazy. I think I saw I can't remember which show I was watching. It was on Amazon Prime or something like that, and they were in they're in the CIA, right? Mm-hmm. And they all had their cell phones, and I'm like, eh, no, right there, mm-hmm. you got you lost me, yeah, because uh, you're not you're not bringing your phone into the skiff. Nope. Um, and I, I always think it's funny when, when, uh, the intelligence community is depicted on any movie, anything like that. It's always just garbage. Like, all, hey, can, can these places hire one person to come in and be like, that's not, that's not how that works, you know? Oh yeah. But the all, answer always is the same. More this exciting. Is, this is entertainment. Right. This, this is, this is, isn't reality. Um, there's, uh, an old line, uh, about, uh, that says, uh, the movie should be more like life. This dates back uh-huh. 50 years plus. Uh, and someone said, no, no, no. Life should be more like the movies. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it isn't. <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, I think that's a good way to wrap it up, though. Was there anything else you wanted to discuss? Well, you, uh, at one point you were saying, do you have advice for beginners in the business? Uh, yes, and, and, that'd uh, be great. Yeah, I have. I, and for those of you who might think of going into this crazy field, uh, uh, yeah, I can give. Uh, there's two things you have to do. To be a beginner, first you have to get into the business. Right. And then once you're in, you'd like to succeed. Well, getting in is at the national level is hard. Yeah. Uh, you have to have... the exactly the credentials that fit what they happen to be looking for. Mm-hmm. Getting in uh, to intelligence, though, in uh, through the military, through contractors mm-hmm. like yourself, uh, through uh, uh, law enforcement now has intelligence right. Right. Uh, analysis uh, going on. Intelligence uh, analysis is really everywhere. Yeah. You know, uh, what's interesting is I've seen over the years some of my – friends and colleagues, mm-hmm. when they used to go work for Lockheed Martin and Boeing, now they're going to work for Disney, yep. Bank of America, yep. Amazon, Microsoft. There's a lot of opportunity out there if you know how to work with secure data and and you know build that sandcastle that we spoke about. So yeah. it's a great I, career field. It is. I uh, I teach uh, intelligence collection at uh, for online for Johns Hopkins University. And uh, uh, my students come from Disney, mm-hmm. uh, other uh, commercial entities that uh, no relation to national intelligence or military intelligence, right. but that's what they're doing. So, uh, yeah, uh, I can see that. But but 
you, there are lots of ways to get in. You yeah. may not get in to the area you really want to be in. Right. But once you're in and you have credentials, you can move. Right. You've got the the cachet, the clearances maybe, whatever is needed, mm -hmm. uh, and you can ultimately get to the job you want. You yeah. may not be able to get in directly, but you can get there. Yeah, having, having the clearance is a really big deal. And I don't think people, if you're in the military right now and you have a security clearance, mm -hmm. don't lose that. Uh, don't lose that clearance. I can't tell you how many people come back to me years later, say, hey, hey, Nick, can you hire me? You know, I don't have a clearance. Um, mm -hmm. well, it's not much I can do to restart your clearance. Once you lose it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. there's something else, too, that's important for young people or anybody that's interested in working in this crazy intelligence community. And I highly suggest it. Once you get that clearance mm -hmm. and you're in and you're working, mm -hmm. if you want to exceed, if you want to do better, you still have to improve yourself. Mm -hmm. You still have to, to, you know, grow your educational background. Yep. Whether that's through a uh, university or on your own through reading books by Robert Clark or whatever, you still need to grow professionally. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times what I see is some people rest on their laurels, right? They said, I was in the military, I have my clearance, they get out, they become a contractor. Mm -hmm. And then they never, they never do that next step to, to improve. Um, that, that, so I think it's super important to do well, that. Yeah, that's one of the two things that uh, once you're in that you do to succeed. Right. Uh, the other thing you need to do uh, is quite different. It's to build your network uh, because in that business, you're only as good as your network. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you have to look upstream uh, if you're an analyst to uh, collectors and get to know them and uh, help them out where necessary. Uh, right. That was a large part of my success is uh, helping uh, uh, imagery analysts uh, to figure out what was going on in their right. imageries, even though I didn't get any credit for it, but uh, uh, they could do favors for me in turn. Uh, <laughs> well, in the Intel space, you don't get credit for anything. And that's, <laughs> and you have to be okay with that. You have to have, you have to be okay with, hey, look at that national news headline over there. Well, I was pretty integral in that, but you're not gonna see your name anywhere. No, um, I succeeded by, uh, uh, by making sure that people who helped me out got credit. Uh, right. Because uh, yeah. I helped the imagery analysts and make sure they uh, got the credit for it, even though uh, I may have figured out what yeah. was. But you, you said something interesting about your network. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's important for your professional career, of course. But if you're working in the intelligence space, mm -hmm. right, and the, I, I can say the most impact I've ever had on any intelligence operation has been through reaching out and working with the right people and knowing who's who's sitting in what seat, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's hey, Bob, uh, can you tell me what's happening over here? Uh, because that's how you assemble a really good picture, right? You, you leverage that network that um, there's people in this space that are in, you run across them, you might work with them at one place and then two years later, you're in two separate places looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens all the time. And, uh, you know, keeping that network strong and uh, it can help build a better intelligence picture. And as intelligence people, that's what we want to do, right? We want to build the best picture possible. Yep. We want to see that news headline. We don't care if our name's up there. Well, we do care a little bit. We want to see that news headline that we made an impact, right? That's, that's the real crux of the intelligence community. For anyone that's looking to get into a career, mm -hmm. yep. this space, you will make an impact. Mm -hmm. You are going to affect things that happen around the world. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the one thing I think this this upcoming generation and, and maybe even my generation really care about is what I do matter? Does it matter what I do? Mm -hmm. Am I gonna go make money for some bank? Mm -hmm. Am I gonna go, you know, peddle stocks on Wall Street? Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll make a lot of money, but what impact does that really have in the world? And the intelligence community, that's what it's all about. Everyone gets an opportunity to make a positive impact on building a good intelligence picture. Um, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a step back. Maybe not a good impact, an impact, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. it's not always, from the outside, it, it might not always be seen as, as, as positive. Um, but you have that chance. And if, you ha and if you have the right person in the right spot, it really matters that we have smart people helping to, to make those really positive um, impacts and good decisions.
You know, Nick, I think you just nicely summed up uh, uh, the main point I wanted to make, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's a good way to end the uh, okay uh, session. Uh, when I got into it, I, uh, analysis, which is what I did and what you did, really, mm-hmm. uh, I said, "This is the this is the dream job. This is a, right. a, a job." Uh, it was just a joy to be in it, to go to work every day. And when I realized what the job was like, I said, they're going to pay me to do this. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. I do it for nothing. That's awesome. It, it, it is. That's intelligence in a nutshell. Nothing awesome. like it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really hope to, you'll come back again sometime. <laughs> oh, if I can. Uh, I think we've covered all my uh, territory. but I, I doubt it. I highly doubt it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.